Morning, my name is Peter Bryant. I'm a cryptocurrency trader through EBLN DMCC. Over the past 18 months, I've become increasingly aware of the power and um, premise, essentially, of cryptocurrencies in society. My talk today is about how to benefit from that change that's going to happen over the next decade or so. And I hope by the end of the talk, you will have understood, one, what cryptocurrencies are, two, how you can profit for them, and three, I'm hoping to get rid of some of the myths and misconceptions about cryptocurrencies. So today's talk is about what cryptocurrencies are and how they operate and how they actually function, so you actually understand the technology behind them, how they are important and why we really need them as a society and, a, and the economic model that currently exists, why it really fundamentally needs cryptocurrencies to work, and finally, how can you profit from this? Okay, because there are obviously strategies and techniques that I utilize for my clients um, that can be very, very easily replicated by someone who just knows what to do in a certain situation. Those are strategies and techniques. So first of all, what's a cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency is a string of cryptographically secured digital code that represents value. For the first time ever in the history of humankind, we can send value digitally. You might think we could do this via PayPal or bank transfer at the moment. No, an intermediary has to be involved. They have to take a cut, a fee, and they obviously have to validate the transaction. What's more, those intermediaries, if you've been watching the news over the last 10, 15 years, don't typically have a good reputation. Uh, sometimes money goes missing. Sometimes uh, we don't actually have a value on that subscription. Cryptocurrencies are a finite resource. They're actually the only asset class in the world that we know exactly how many of them there are. If you look at anything like precious metals, gold, um, stocks and shares, etc., any company can create new stocks and shares instantaneously just by saying they're going to create new stocks and shares. With cryptocurrencies, we know exactly how many cryptocurrency units there are in the world. It's the first time in human history, uh, it's the first time in history that humans can actually exchange value, as I've said. And cryptocurrencies are powered through a technology called Bit. Um, blockchain technology effectively and I'm going to explain about blockchain technology a little bit now. So understanding blockchain technology. So effectively a blockchain is just an accounting ledger. That's all it is. It's just as simple as having a list of transactions that is added to over a period of time. The key thing is this is done completely automatically in a blockchain whereas with anything else it's done manually, typically by a bank. Okay. And over the course of the transactions, each transaction goes through the bank and is matched, used to be by person, now it's more or so done by computers. But those computers can have errors, they can have problems. And the banking system, which is called SWIFT, which was invented in 1973, predates the VHS. So it theoretically has a lot of issues with it. And every so often, there's an error. And that transaction goes missing or gets distorted in some way, and therefore, there is insurance necessitated on every single transaction that goes through, which costs everyone around the world around $1.6 trillion per year, just in fees. Okay? This is why the banking industry is so large and they've managed to make so much money because obviously they're charging every single one of us to use banking on a daily basis, but it's a loss leader for personal banking at least. Business banking is a little bit different story, but personal banking is a loss leader because they're hoping you're going to take out a mortgage or something like that. And when the average person in the world pays around $270,000 of interest across their entire lifeline. It's a fantastic money spinner for the banks. With the blockchain technology, with the cryptocurrency, that accounting ledger is completely automatic and it's done worldwide. So it's a distributed network of computers that completely takes away the middleman effectively of ledger a transaction. If the transaction fails for any reason, it's not accepted by the ledger. It has a 0% failure rate. In order for the transaction to fail, the laws of physics would have to be invalidated. So this is the way that cryptocurrency effectively works. It takes a group of transactions, feeds them into the network, and then on the back of that network, we have a block which is generated. Okay, and that block represents, for Bitcoin, 2,020 uh, transactions. Okay? And over time, these transactions stay in the blockchain forever and they can be validated at any point and they're also completely transparent. So if I was sending you some capital, you could check with the blockchain before you even received it whether it had been sent or not. But at the same time, it's completely anonymous because unless you have the hexadecimal string that I'm using and you, ha and you have as well, that means you're completely anonymous effectively. So it's both transparent and anonymous simultaneously. And over time, those transactions build up and that is the blockchain. So right now there are 
thousands of transactions going through the Bitcoin network right now, which are adding blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks. And over time, that block structure gets bigger. An exercise. Right. I would like you, the red coins are units of a cryptocurrency network. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to pass these around as quickly as possible so they all end up back over here, which is me, the central bank, effectively. Okay? Um, I have an incentive, or rather uh, a punishment. Um, if um, we're going to time these effectively, um, if uh, we manage to get these blue chips, which represent a bank, faster than the red chips, um, then you don't have to eat one of these uh, habanero chilies, which are... 140 times hotter than jalapenos. Um, so, yeah, um, there is enough for everyone here. So, um, just putting that there. So, effectively, what I'm hoping with this exercise is you're going to be able to pass the red chips around faster than the blue chips. If, by any chance, the blue chips do take longer, then the, uh, the chilies are very much on offer. Okay? So, we're going to start that now. I'm going to pass these to, to Jim. Just like you to pass, um, one at time. pass them one at a time around the network. And I'm just going to time by counting one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43. Fantastic, 43. Congratulations, you've just been a blockchain. That is literally the process. Starting from Jim, moving over to the other side of the table, that is the blockchain network. Okay, 43 seconds. Right, I'm going to do the same thing again, but this time you're going to be a bank. Okay, you're going to be a financial person involved in a bank transaction where you don't have any information about where your money is going, where your currency is going or anything. All you know is there's a black box. You put your money in the bank and something happens to it and maybe at some point in the future you could withdraw it. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing again, but this time you're going to have your eyes shut. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Another time. I'm going to, um, if I see disaster, I'll stop counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 1, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, <laughs> seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Good. Well done. That's very apt. Sometimes money goes missing. One in twenty transactions actually fail um, on the global banking networks, um, which necessitates insurance and is why the system is effectively so bad. Um, it's a really, really inefficient way of transferring money, okay? Um, you're actually very good there. I was expecting uh, I was say more of a disaster, but you actually took around about 30 seconds longer to do the blindfolded version than you did the uh, genuine version, so well done. So cryptocurrencies are the application of blockchain technology mm. to finance, effectively. And what they do is they solve what's known as the double spend problem, okay? How do I know in a certain transaction without a third party, that the hundred pounds you want to send me, you haven't spent somewhere else prior to it, okay? And the cryptographic network of validation ensures that the finances you send to me are legitimate and real, okay? 
So it's the most ex uh, secure way of exchanging value ever invented. Okay? It's completely automatic and does not rely on anyone or anything to validate or keep a record of the transaction. There are satellites right now processing Bitcoin transactions that if the entire world economy went down the, down, you know, down the pan, they would still be validated. Okay? So it has a resilience of Amazon, Google, Twitter, Facebook, all combined. There's far less vulnerability to attacks and technological issues because it's a distributed network. If you want to attack one part of the system, another part of the system will just take over, and that part of the system can be repaired or managed. There are over 4 million computers right now, servers, running the Bitcoin network as we speak. And they're all independent of each other. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple effectively are valuable assets whose use is only going to increase over the next century because of these factors, because they represent the only way of digitally exchanging value, and because they are effectively free to use when combined with these current system. If you were doing that trans transaction with the volume fold effectively um, as a real bank, what you'd be doing is you'd be pocketing one of the chips every single time you uh, put, the, put the 40 through, basically. Uh, whereas with cryptocurrency, the fees are, fees are much, much smaller. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Here we have a pizza, okay? You've seen pizzas all over the place. You've probably eaten quite a few um, in your lifetime, as I have. Um, a value of a pizza. What would you say a typical value of a pizza is? Ten quid, something like that. Depends where you get it from. Okay. Um, this pizza is actually a special pizza. This pizza was actually the first tangible Bitcoin transaction. Back in 2010, there was a gentleman who actually wanted to do something with his Bitcoin because he'd only been collecting it for a while and he hadn't actually done anything with it. So he wrote on a forum and said, I'd like to auction these 10,000 Bitcoin for one pizza. And four days later, because things were very slow um, back in those days, someone said, you know what? I'll purchase a pizza on a credit card in London, actually, and get it uh, delivered to you, um, obviously using their local one in Florida, um, for the 10,000 Bitcoin. Okay? That person sacrificed 10,000 Bitcoin for one pizza. Seven years later, that, those Bitcoin were worth 150,000 pounds. So that person lost the opportunity of having 150,000 pounds of, uh, of that Bitcoin. So effectively, that pizza cost that person 150,000 pounds. That's what's known as opportunity cost. It's a loss of other paths when one path is chosen. That person happened to have a lot more Bitcoin than just the 10,000, so they weren't that um, you know, perturbed. They're also a developer as well, so they were part of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Um, but effectively, that's what we're demonstrating. The vast majority of people who don't invest in cryptocurrencies are going to face a massive opportunity cost because the value of where everything is at the moment is substantially lower than where it is, will be in the future because there's a finite limit to the amount of Bitcoin that's available, Ethereum, Ripple, etc. All cryptocurrencies have a finite limit, but they have to have that limit by design. So, why was Bitcoin suddenly worth £15,000? You know? Why did something go from 0.001 US dollar all the way to £15,000 or US dollars in the space of seven years? 58, no, 200 million percent is now 58 million percent. It's the best performing asset class in history. No other asset class has performed as well or as robustly. So this is it, effectively. This is its rise. And you can see on the charts, nothing for ages. This is back in 2011. Then suddenly out of nowhere, a massive spike to $30. That is the biggest movement that an asset has ever done. And it's also the quickest movement an asset has ever done in history. Then, if we extrapolate that a little bit further, we can see 2013. That is that peak we just saw. Okay. We had another peak up to $225. Once again, nothing for ages, and then suddenly out of nowhere, a big peak. Okay? Then extrapolating out again, we have the third movement. That one, once again, this is the first movement, that's the second movement, this is the third movement. All the way up to $1,100. Okay? Bear in mind, this is only over the space of two, three, four years. Then again, most recently, this is the one that grabbed the headlines. This is the one where suddenly everyone heard about Bitcoin. Because suddenly, out of nowhere, in the space of four months, it went from effectively 1,000 all the way up to 20,000. Once again, you can't even see the, the, the first peaks now. Uh, this is the second most recent one, and then the largest one all the way up to 20,000. Okay, so nothing for ages then suddenly. And if we extrapolate out in the next few years, this is a prediction of mine based on the analysis and research and uh, 
chart technicals that I can look at, which actually theoretically predicted this last movement, we have this movement, all the way up to 100,000 US dollars. Okay? And this is based on a number of factors and a number of prediction tools, but effectively, that is only a smaller movement than what has already happened. The amount of capital that it actually took to move Bitcoin from down here to here, in proportion terms, is actually smaller than what it takes to get it to 100,000. Okay? Long-term estimates for Bitcoin are somewhere in the region of 1.5 to 2 million pounds per coin. That's in about 10, 15 years' time. So why does this happen? Well, usually with asset classes and usually with investments, we're faced with a linear model of operation. As time goes by, the asset price increases, usually as a product of inflation with the currency, the actual trading with devaluing systematically, but also because more people are using it. Every single time a stock and share is bought, the S&P 500, the FTSE 100, any big index, gains slightly, okay? And the more people that come on board, the bigger it is. Because population growth is expanding, we slowly see an implicit rise in what's known as correlational assets. These are stocks and shares, property, bonds, interest ICA, ISAs, buy-to-lets, index and mutual funds, foreign exchange, and arts and alternatives. Basically, if you think of investment, it's probably going to be linear. Okay? But what happens to a linear investment when the correlate, the underlying thing that everything is relying on, which is the economy, outperforms or underperforms? Okay? We've just been through the longest stretch of economic growth in history, but we've also been through the largest period of debt as well. When things go wrong, everything goes south. We have, a, we have a recession, we have a depression, effectively. This is designed into the model that we utilize. It's not an artifact of just rogue traders, or it's not an artifact of just the way the world works. This is built into the system. It leads to this, as you're probably aware. We had to we have one in 2008, where suddenly a subprime mortgage crisis in America caused the collapse of property, stocks and shares markets, $9.8 trillion was lost pretty much in 24 hours because suddenly the entire rug was pulled under from underneath these mainstream asset classes. Okay. Why? Okay. We've got a situation where over the past 12 years, debt has been rising up, countrywide debt effectively. We've got a situation where correlational risk and asymmetric risks are independent. Cryptocurrencies rely on something called asymmetric risk which is where the asset price, compared to its value, long-term value, is very, very small. When I say that Bitcoin is currently you know, worth around about 7,000 pounds and in time was worth half a million pounds, you can see the downside risk is a lot smaller than the upside risk. Okay? Chances are Bitcoin isn't actually going to drop a lot further because of the number of people, as I'll get to in a second, and I'll explain in a minute, will hold their Bitcoin because they're aware of this fact. Okay? The correlational risk is what everyone thinks is great. That's where you put your Vanguard money, that's where you put your pension, because over time it does this slowly, 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 just like a roller coaster. As soon as it gets to the top, down it comes. Now obviously, over a massive period, i.e. 50, 100 years, you do see an increase on average, okay? But are you prepared to take the seven, 14 year hit? Someone invested in the S&P 500 in 2000, for example, if they waited to 2007, would have seen a profit. But if they invested in the same time in 2007 for the same period, they would have seen a loss, around a 50% loss, in fact, in one year, followed by 10% per year after that. That's because they were timing the market, and obviously, when you time the market, you can be going through a series of growth or decline. Property markets are strong related with the performance of the economy, for example. At the moment, every property is high value. Okay? Uh, we've got massive oversupply of people wanting to buy it, property, um, but the prices are are climbing higher and higher and higher. Precious metal investments, for example, have a history of being a non-correlational asset. When things go wrong, people go into safe haven asset classes as they know them, and we see a, a surge in those markets as a result. Playing the lottery is an example of a high asymmetrical risk factor. You're practically guaranteed to lose your money, um, but you have a very, very small chance of actually winning something, okay? Um, but where buying a cheap classic car, for example, that you know has intrinsic worth and could be worth something in the future and doing it up, that has a high risk to reward ratio. So effectively, this is the uh, linear way of looking at things. Price times time equals profit or loss, where the correlate is the global economy and the fiat currency system effectively. Whereas for cryptocurrencies, 
its price uh, to the power of y times time to the power of y, uh, which equals profit or loss, effectively. The correlate is the number of users, okay? And y is the total market capitalization. So the market capitalization at the moment is around 200 billion US dollars. If that increased to 300 billion US dollars, because the amount of unit is capped, the prices would increase by one third, effectively. So there are three main cryptocurrencies, the, the market leaders, if you like, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. They all do different things, okay? And they all have different purposes. Bitcoin is the market leader, because that's the one that everyone knows about. Ethereum is a distributed computing network, so it's like look at Amazon Web Services effectively, but it's completely not owned by anyone. It also is completely autonomous. And Ripple is a liquidity provider effectively. That means that you can send transactions very, very quickly and very, very easily using its network anywhere in the world. I've personally seen a transaction of $300 million go through the Ripple network for three cents. That was the fee that was charged. Where if you went through a bank and did that, it would cost you several million just in fees. There are caps and finite limits to the amount of cryptocurrency that can, that can exist as part of their design. 21 million Bitcoin can only ever exist. We're at about 18 and a half million now that have been actually mined and created. 120 to 140 million Ethereum, we're on about the 110 mark at the moment. And 100 billion XRP, we're on about 50, but they're actually pre-mined, they're already created, they're not actually mined as, as part of the process. They all exist, they're just held back. And Ripple is the one that's been gaining the most traction because it's run like a financial services company. It's not a distributed network like Bitcoin <coughs> and Ethereum are. Ripple is actually, um, you know, they can understand it. FinTech can effectively understand Ripple because they're run by Ripple Labs. It's all centralized, it goes through the same process, but they use cryptographic technology in order to secure the transactions. Big users of Ripple are American Express, Santander, Barclays, HSBC. They've used uh, Ripple extensively over the last two years. The chances are that if you banked at all internationally or had a payment service through a credit card recently, it would have more than likely used the Ripple network as it's part of its process. So effectively what we have here is a difference between a correlate and a crypto. Because the market size is capped, the more money that gets introduced into it, the higher the price. Whereas with a correlate, because it's always got something missing, because we can always create more of something, um, more property, more bonds, more government debt, more anything, it doesn't cap, it doesn't affect the price, it just ticks along slowly. This is why we see the exponential returns, okay? Because the market cap is finite, given a space. If suddenly a load of capital gets introduced in that space, the asset price does this. So it's an exponential market as opposed to a linear market because over time, the linear price just increases per unit, whereas when we introduce a lot of capital, we see an exponential curve. So, What's the problem with fiat? Why can't we use normal money? You know, if I have a five pound note in my pocket, what's wrong with this? What's effectively wrong with this? Well, this is just a promise. It's a promise to pay the bearer of the sum five pounds at a future date. And as long as we keep this in circulation, everyone knows I will get five pounds. But what actually is five pounds? When fiat currency was actually introduced, it used to be backed by metal, gold and silver. It used to be asset backed, okay, um, back in 19... Uh, September th 19th, 1931, the US decided that the dollar was no good. And then Bretton Woods Agreement came into effect and every fiat currency from there on, all 115 of them, has not been asset backed. Okay. When the pound was first introduced back in the 1700s, um, it was worth 12 troy ounces, which today, if it was on parity, would have a value of 200 pounds. Okay. So this would be worth 1,000 pounds if the value had stayed constant. The pound is now worth 0.05% of its original purchasing power. In fact, every fiat currency on earth is in a race to zero purchasing power. We've seen this in Venezuela, Weimar, Germany, etc., Hungary, for example. There are currently in the world 10 fiat currencies that are over 10% inflation, which means that a year ago, it costs you 10% more now to purchase what you could for a, for a year ago. In Venezuela, in April 2019, inflation was measured at 298,000%. That's what happens when a, uh, when a fiat currency goes to zero and everyone loses faith in the value of that asset. We call this systematic devaluation, inflation, and central banks and governments have a target around 2% a year. There's a target for how much your money loses value over a given period, i.e. a year, and that's generally set at 2%. This five pound note 
um, if you take it back a decade, is now only worth probably about £3.50 in terms of actual purchasing power. So if you had a £50 note from 1981, when the £50 note was first introduced, is actually worth £13 today. If held for 50 years, for example, in a cash pension, it's actually worth £2. So we have a very much of a problem with fiat currency in that it systematically devalues over time. You can actually see this here. This is the purchasing power of the pound from 1975 to present day, effectively. And as you can see, systematically getting lower and lower and lower and lower. It does drop off eventually with a sudden drop, but that sudden drop is hyperinflation where the complete currency goes um, AWOL, effectively. Governments have two options in this circumstance. They can either replace the currency, as happened with the euro, where 15 currencies got replaced between 1999 and 2008, or they can adopt another technology. The end game for an overapplied currency is hyperinflation. That's, um, that was what was used to purchase the loaf of bread um, in, that, in that currency. The world is $250 trillion in debt. That's not personal debt, by the way. That's government debt. So effectively, every man, woman, and child owes £25,000 just for using fiat currency. Okay. That's actually just crossed over the $250 trillion barrier for the first time ever. World assets, just in case you're wondering, $544 trillion. So we're effectively using half of the net assets of the world in debt at the moment. And that's just not staying there. That's accruing at a 4 to 8% interest compounded every single year. Um, in America, we've taken on uh, an additional $1 trillion worth of debt every single year since um, the current president came to power. Um, yeah, it's uh, not looking good for fiat currencies. So how can we stop this? Well, the short answer is you can't, really. Um, it's too much of a big problem now to actually yield any, any significant change. You could, of course, raise taxes to pay off the debt. Um, that won't be particularly popular, but um, you could, over an extended period, maybe 40, 50 years, pay back all the debt that's needed um, with a phenomenal tax overhaul. Um, or you could switch to an asset-backed start of currency. Unfortunately, in the world at the moment, there's no asset which is worth $250 trillion, especially a real asset as opposed to a you know, synthetic asset. The only option we kind of have is to abandon fiat currency altogether and start with something new, something fresh, okay? Something like cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin was once worth 0.1 dollar, 10 cents, effectively, back in 2010. I have clients who remember being offered Bitcoin, 50 Bitcoin for, for five, for five dollars, effectively, five pounds. Um, they thought it was just a fad. They didn't think it had any long-term viability, so they didn't take them up on it. Today, that will be worth around about £450,000. Today's prices will almost be legendary in years to come. People will look back on these prices. Bitcoin right now is around 7,000. Ethereum is around about 100. And Ripple is around about 15p. They will look back on these prices and think, goodness gracious, why didn't I invest? Why didn't I do anything? Um, and extrapolating out from these charts, as we can see, is, gives us the prediction of where Bitcoin is most likely probabilistically to be in the course of the next 20, 30 years. So this is a chart where I've done exactly that. So you can see the first generation here, this is the big spike. Then we have the second generation peak. Then the third generation peak at the top there with 20,000. And then fourth generation peak will be somewhere between 80,000 and 500,000, probably close to 500,000 because when the market takes off again, everyone will want to, um, what's known as FOMO, which is fear of missing out and buy regardless of the price. So in actual fact, the majority of Bitcoin was actually bought over 10,000. People didn't buy it at 5,000, 4,000. They bought it at 10,000 because they suddenly had validation for buying something that was going somewhere. What happened? They went up to 19,000 three weeks later. Majority of people didn't bank their profits because they wanted it to go to 25,000, and it came slamming back down to 3,000 um, over the space of nine months. A lot of people sold out right at the bottom because they were fearful it was going further. So effectively, you have this paradoxical way of investing where you buy high and you sell low, okay? Because you're not actually doing what you should be doing in terms of holding when you should hold and selling when you should sell. How can you profit from this? So investing now when prices are relatively low is key, effectively. The market will do most of the work for you when it takes off. Trading in and out of the market at key price points is what I specialize in, and it's a way to compound your investment. Because if it can make you double your capital in the space of six months, 
you then have a lot more capital to add to your arsenal when the market does start its massive movements, exponential movements, effectively. Just out of interest, we've got a situation where I can actually show you the median price. So you can actually see this. So the number of users here is the black line at the bottom. Okay? So these are the number of people, 8 million of them, okay, at present time, who will never sell their Bitcoin because they're vested in this going to half a million. Okay? If the price came down to $1 tomorrow, they just buy as many as they possibly could. And because the asset price is fixed and the number of units are fixed, they will be able to do that and push the price back up very, very quickly. Then we've got the median price, which is the dotted line. That is the average price over the past um, 10 years or so. As you can see, despite its volatility, it has always been on the increase. Okay, so we've seen a constant increase in the price over the last 10 years, regardless of what the volatility experts claim. Okay. And then, obviously, the dotted line at the top is the potential highest price of this movement. Okay. So what are your expected returns of investing in cryptocurrency at the moment? So if you put £1 in Bitcoin at current prices, you can expect to make £20 okay, over the next five years. Ethereum, £1 will make £30. That's because it's got a wiser user basis and there's more capital deployed in Ethereum because it actually has programs that run on it as opposed to just being an exchange of value. Ripple, £40. That's just because it's the cheapest asset class at the moment. Theoretically, during 2017, it went to $3.00. 15 cents all the way to $3 is a phenomenal return which won't be able to be formed by Bitcoin because it's currently a lot more expensive and therefore takes a lot more capital to rise the, for the price to rise effectively. So just a little about the company that I work for, um, EBLN DMCC, we're a Dubai-based company specialising in trading uh, precious metals and Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple. Um, we have an institutional partner to do that. Um, we're a team of professional brokers and traders who will effectively teach you how to invest using the best strategies and techniques uh, and maybe even do it for you too, subject to agreements. Um, you have access, if you become a client, to a free professional um, situation of analysis and market research where you get emailed on a daily basis and also communicated with over the telephone as frequently as possible, as frequently as you like, about current updates to the market. The cryptocurrency market is very fast, very quick, um, developments are all over the place and keeping abreast of everything is particularly um, demanding. We have access to leverage and other advanced trading facilities that's not available elsewhere and we know how to use them appropriately. And personally, I've managed uh, over $10 million worth of trades in 2019 with an average of 21% net profitability um, across all my accounts. Thank you very much for listening. Um, just in case you're wondering, that is an exponential growth. And that is my book that I'm publishing next month on cryptocurrency profits, um, which effectively takes you much more in depth as to what I've talked about today and um, goes on a little bit more about how to trade effectively, when to buy, when to sell, and trading signals, etc. So, thank you. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So with HSBC and banks, etc., it's Ripple that they're using primarily. They're not particularly keen on Bitcoin, Ethereum. They don't really trust the decentralized model. But Ripple Labs effectively have created effectively a PayPal for cryptocurrencies called, um, called um, Ripple X, basically, or X Rapid, um, which effectively funnels capital into the into the ripple network and then out again the other side so say for example you have a bank in dubai that wants to bank with a bank in singapore okay their modus operandi at the moment is to use the us dollar so what that transaction has to do is it has to go from the currency in dubai to america through bank of america merrill lynch and then to singapore with merrill lynch taking a cut of minimum 25 dollars to three percent of the transaction for every single time that happens okay with Ripple, what they've been able to do is send that currency directly to the bank that needs the funds, basically, um, effectively for nothing, more, via a more direct route, okay? So banks have gone, ah, you know what? We, we get this, we can, we can use this to beat the competition effectively. We can lower our margins. And that's why it's been so widely adopted by those banks who've basically tried to be the first mover in that field. 
because they understand that Ripple Labs is a Silicon Valley based technology company. They have, um, you know, um, they have contacts with the IMF, with the, um, you know, the global head of economic uh, forums, basically. And over the last eight years, they've been able to develop um, strategic partnerships with companies that want to send huge amounts of capital very, very cheaply. And effectively, that's why Ripple has taken off um, effectively as the default liquidity provider for worldwide interbank transactions. That's a lot of things, and you mentioned that um, six hundred, there are 600 ATMs in this country. Yes, you yes. Actual yeah, so worldwide there are over, there are over 6,000 ATMs that you can get an instant transaction um, fiat currency withdrawal for your Bitcoin. So you use a payment provider like Revolut or TransferWise, and you can withdraw fiat currency from Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, there are obviously fees involved, et cetera, but it's, in regards to it being kind of this thing that no one uses, you can use it. You can purchase things through it. Um, you can buy goods and services with Bitcoin um, and not illegal ones like the media likes to believe, um, likes to, likes to per uh, perpetuate. Um, it is a situation that is becoming more mainstream, but effectively, um, at the moment, they're not being utilized in the way that they should be utilized. They're being hoarded by investors who are privy to this information about them being finite and about the, the user basis being a lot more fundamentally driven than you know, just making a bit of cash here and there by trading effectively. When they reach parity where they should be, which is what I've alluded to with Bitcoin going to six figures, you can break Bitcoin down into units of 10, uh, of 100 million by the way, and still use smaller units called Satoshi, which is 100 millionth of Bitcoin. Um, they will be much widely adopted, much more widely adopted. Um, effectively, it's like saying, you know, um, the only way you can trade at the moment is worth a 500 pound note. You can't do anything less. Um, and you can, you know, you can try and buy, you weekly shop with a 500 pound note. People are going to be like, oh, why would I do that? Effectively, that's what we've got the same situation at the moment is with Bitcoin. As the market grows and matures and as the prices reach where they should be in terms of long term outlook, then um, they will be much more widely utilized and they'll start to perform in a similar way to fiat currencies with foreign exchange, where the movements are much, much smaller. They don't do massive liquidity movements um, in 24 hours, as they do at the moment, because it's a much smaller market, and therefore, um, you know, smaller, if, people, if one person decides to sell 100 Bitcoin, it will come crashing down. When the diversification of the market and the utilization of the market becomes broader, those movements will be much, much smaller, enabling transactions that should take place using you know, something like cryptocurrency, which people can reliably go, oh yeah, that's worth X. Just like we do with the pound coin. The pound coin actually fluctuates all the time. We just don't realize it. If you go on, you know, look at the moment, it's at a six, well, it's at a four year high, I think, believe at the moment, against the dollar. Um, you know, we, we, it doesn't change our day to day lives. But in actual fact, someone who's buying and selling, as I do, in euros and dollars all the time, my, my paycheck is in dollars and euros, um, makes quite a difference. But that's only because I'm very privy to the movements. Most people in, in the world who are dealing with one currency are not, okay? They don't really mind if the price, but obviously we use it for um, politics and that kind of thing. But if you go on holiday, you become particularly prevalent to, uh, to market movements. But by and large, no one really cares what the value of the pound is as long as it stays relatively stable, which will happen with cryptocurrencies, but over a 15 year time frame. Except it doesn't seem to work uh, Oh, of course, yeah, naturally, yeah. Effectively, it means a promise. It means a. Um, I believe it's Latin. Yeah. Yes. Let 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 there be or something. I I have it written in the book, but I haven't actually. Uh, I can't remember it right now. Um, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a Latin term. Um, effectively, what it means, it, the central premise is that. It's a promise, effectively. Technically, fiat currency is a debt. I mean, this five pound note here is a debt to a government, effectively. Yeah, it's an IOU that we just pass around. But it ha we feel it has value because it's always had value, effectively, in our eyes, okay? But effectively, this is just a debt that you can go up to the government or a central bank in, in modern ages and say, oh, I've got this five pounds, please can I have you know, something else? Apart from you can't do that anymore because there's nothing else to trade it with. Um, it's not backed by anything. It used to be the fact that this represented 
silver, for example, and you could go and get your silver and then you can go spend it wherever you want and there was two variables. But this today is just paper money. Effectively, it's not really worth anything long term. And minimum in investment in Sure. Um, for a generally good portfolio of all asset classes, I'd say 10,000. 10,000 sterling. If you're looking to get six figures out of the cryptocurrency market, that is where I start with my, with my clients, effectively. Anything smaller than that, if you're going to buy and hold, I'd recommend just doing something for coin, through Coinbase and like that. You can fund through Coinbase for smaller amounts, but with everything as it is at the moment, um, that I recommend clients start with 10,000. Uh, one Bitcoin, um, 16 Ethereum, and 10,000 Ripple. That is um, systematically ensures you theoretically will be um, holding a hundred thousand pound portfolio by 2025. Any more questions? Any more questions? Mm. You talked about Ripple. Mm. Hundred billion, yes. But only fifty distributed. Yes. So who holds Ripple Labs? And what they've been doing is they've re releasing it with, with partnerships with banks and financial institutions effectively. So what they've been doing is releasing a billion a month to corporate entities effectively. Their main interest is, is corporates um, at the moment. So in actual fact, it's only relatively recently you can actually buy Ripple as a private investor. Um, they auction off 15, 20 um, million at a time. Um, to their private and to their clients effectively, and then they utilize those um, as part of the network. So effectively what they're trying to do, they will release over the next three, four years, the entire batch. And actually Ripple is quite interesting in that 5,000 are destroyed every single day um, as part of the burn rate, which is a way of controlling like manipulation of the pricing effectively. So if a trader wants to come in and just completely manipulate the market, um, as happens with unregulated investments quite often, um, they will pay a substantial price for doing that. So there's a, there's a protection mechanism in place basically to make sure the asset price is always fair and stable. Um, but that burn rate effectively means that, well, over the next 5,000 years, the ripple value will halve, well, the number of ripple will actually halve. So in actual fact, it's anti-inflationary, or deflationary, if you like, um, because it's, it's got the added level of protection against it. Uh, inflation because rather than just being fixed it actually reduces over time by a very very small amount so yeah that's why they're holding them back effectively 50 million are in uh, 50 billion are in circulation at the moment with the other 50 um, being released systematically to partnerships as they go along does that answer your question I'm not sure. okay <laughs> January, it will be out in January. Um, yeah, early January, I'm hoping for. It's uh, currently being printed. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> how many? I like that question. Um, no, it's, um, it will be available in fiat currency, um, ironically. Um, but um, yeah, I'll probably be, I will have a method of paying for it in um, cryptocurrency. But if you follow the logic, it's, it's actually conducive not to buy it with cryptocurrency but you know yeah. I'm sure there's some people will but yeah thank you very much yeah, thank you. Thank you.